get a couple of minutes for questions. Running close, close, close to trying. The next door neighbours seem like they've taken the New South Wales government development process in their part, which is good. Yet another crane rising over the city. Um, so, questions from the floor for Michael as soon as he gets talked up. This is fascinating information. The, the underlying questions which Michael's touched on today are remarkable. Language learning, for example, actually depends upon the ability of communities to provide emotional opportunities, which you can't do in dispersed communities. So there's all sorts of hidden stuff in the background. If you look at the free fall of language enrollment since the 1960s, it's largely been the result of attempts to try and centrally plan the curriculum. So um, there's all sorts of information tucked away in, in, in this data, which you might like to unpack by asking questions. So questions from Paul at the back. Hello, uh, Jane Anderson from Take New South Wales. Thank you for a very, very interesting uh, presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, you were mentioning you have some uh, interactions with international schools, and I'm wondering, do your group of schools then have exchanges, and we've heard about languages, do the, are there opportunities for um, children from New South Wales to interact with, uh, directly with um, other children from other countries? Uh, thanks, Jane. Um, yeah, yes. Uh, I suppose it occurs on a whole range of different levels. Uh, one is it is done individually by schools, so schools have relationships uh, with uh, international schools. Um, most of it is happening online, um, and some of the heads here might be able to. He's up in my wallet. <laughs> Yeah, having educated all those all those grandchildren, might, you know, there's nothing in it. So, so. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, so most of it's online, um, and uh, probably fair to say that the majority of the interaction is in Asia. Um, and uh, I'd say, if I was to narrow it down, more China and Korea these these days. Uh, so yes, th that that occurs. The the international schools that we have as global members, they tend to be um, stereotypically about 60% of the population will be expats, Australian expats, and um, in, in a lot of the jurisdictions, the local government puts restrictions on the number of locals who can attend the international schools, um, and it probably reflects the fact that those local communities uh, value, you know, Australian education. Uh, so they all conduct the, uh, well those schools that are members of ours conduct the New South Wales HSC. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Michael, fantastic presentation. Austin and Karolia from Indy Grammar, lovely seeing you and uh, thank you for sharing that. I certainly learned a few things. Can you share with us what the future looks like in terms of resourcing and funding. That's always a big issue in independent schools because we've seen this growth, the tremendous things being done by independent schools, but it's always to be resourced and paid for. Um, what can you share with us in terms, particularly of the Commonwealth recurrent funding? Well, um, I'll obviously try and do that in a couple of minutes because it's a huge area. Let me start by saying that the quantum of funding by the Australian government uh, to schools is the highest of any any country in the world. That that needs to be stated. So there's there's um, uh, a great generosity of spirit, and I think Mark said in his opening address about the if you like the the, the broadest or the, the greatest breadth of um, um, you know, non-government schools in the world. And that's that's correct. I mean, you, you could say that. I'm technically incorrect because Belgium has uh, a, a, a lot more uh, independent schools, but they're they're really government schools. You know, under, um, they're under a government umbrella. But in in terms of true independence, um, we have a relationship with um, a, a group called NACE uh, in the U.S. And most of you probably be aware that independent schools in the U.S. get no funding whatsoever. Um, so it's very very different. 
So, low SES schools like yourself, Osman, the other unity, um, you're, you're receiving, I'm, I'm round figures here, roughly 70% of um, what it costs to educate a child in the government school would, would come to, to your school. That's not all from the uh, Commonwealth, of course. Um, uh, the state government uh, pr provides that, that funding. The new model um, now sets in concrete 80% of funding comes from the federal government, 20% from the state. And um, I, I think the, the model that has been broken by um, uh, Minister Birmingham at, at least gives us some certainty um, over the coming years, that transition you know, for those schools that are not on the SRS, the schools resource standard, um, know that what they're going to get over the next 10 years. And um, I, I think you'll find that, that um, that'll work out reason, reasonably well. I, I, I don't want to get into um, the sectorial debate because I don't think it gets you anywhere. And you know, history is history, and, and um, there's no point looking back. We should be looking forward. Uh, for some schools, um, their, the change of their status in funding is going to hurt them. Um, there are there are a number of schools here in New South Wales um, who are taking cuts in real terms, um, and 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 yeah, people are quick to jump and say, "Oh, they are overfunded." No, they're not. They were funded according to the government's funding model. They weren't overfunded, um, and and I think that was the uh, error, if you like, of previous governments of, of letting a system go on uh, which was unsustainable. And on that, um, indexation in education um, typically, until recent times, has been running at somewhere between five and six percent per annum. I mean, anyone in the room here, you know, Barry here as a former premier, would know that's unsustainable. You can't keep, you know, adding five to six percent to your bottom line every year. And the only area in um, social funding where it is higher is health, and that's running at about six percent. At, at the moment. So something's got to be done. You can't keep adding that to, to, to your budget. So I, 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 my comments are that I think um, the level of funding is yeah, under the current model is probably about right. Um, parents uh, are, are, you know, are contributing very significantly to their, their children's education and they've done that in the past and I'll continue to do that. I've always argued that we're pricing ourselves out of the market. But we're not. You look at the numbers, we've got people lined up. So. Hi, uh, my name is Seth. I'm coming from an architecture design firm where we design um, public schools for the mm -hmm. Department of Education. Yes. Um, just to address some of the things that you said, for example, um, lack, of, lack of schools, smaller areas for new school buildings. To address some of these items, we also started to design high rise schools. One of the schools we are designing is now four stories for a primary school. Um, also, the teaching typology is changing now. If you remember schools of, let's say, 30 years ago, it was all desk chairs, desk chairs. Now, school floor plates start to look like a campus launch, if you like. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just also more curious about how you address these sort of um, Typology changes and external pressures on smaller areas for school building. Do you also have a, let's say, a strategy to go with a higher end school, or do you have some principles to um, to reduce the school, the new school buildings to, let's say, two levels or something? So, do you have some constraints, or do you also prefer to address these sort of uh, external pressures to go with uh, higher schools for your new? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, keep, keep in mind that um, I can't speak for all independent schools because, remember, independent schools by definition are independent. And um, they're, they're all, um, or pretty much all, companies limited by guarantee or they're under a uh, church or ordinance of some description. So they're, they're separate companies. Um, we already have a number of our schools that are already high rise. People forget that. Um, St Andrews um, in the city who's been operating there for I don't know how long, you know, 20 years in, in a high rise. International Grammar School at, um, 
at Piermont, similarly, there's an old warehouse that's been converted into, uh, into, into a school. So I think the principle of having uh, high-rise schools um, is certainly one that uh, is the only solution for some areas within Sydney. I don't think there's a solution to that. When you travel throughout Europe, um, and I detected a bit of an accent there, so I'm sure I'm sure you've done done this. You, you'll see that most of the, the schools in Europe are high-rise schools, and they rely on community property for their outdoor activities. I think they've got it right. Um, you know, the, the New South Wales government is saying to us now, if we want to attract capital funding then the schools we build in the future must be built in such a way that the community can get access to the facilities. I agree with that, it makes sense. Um, the community, in a sense, is contributing by, uh, it, through its taxes for, for capital grants. Um, so why can't the community use the playing fields? Why can't they use a library? Why can't they use the halls? It, it's the same philosophy under which um, the BER operated when um, the then Prime Minister uh, Gillard uh, made it mandatory that, that all of these halls that were being built would be available to local school communities. So I agree, I agree with that. In an ideal world, we're a bit spoilt in Australia because we've had expansive um, uh, land. Um, that's no longer the case. And so I think you're going to see increasingly schools built on a smaller uh, envelope of land and probably ac uh, accessing um, you know, community facilities so uh, close by. I think that's probably it. Now, in terms of um, in terms of how we design these schools, um, look, you know, it blows my mind to go into schools at the moment and, and look at how things are done. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a bit of a traditionalist, a bit probably been out of schools too too long um, to uh, to a, a, appreciate uh, what is happening, but but facilities increasingly are being built uh, to accommodate a range of modes of learning and um, I think that's very creative and that's a sensible way for, for, for schools to be built. So you're right, no longer, uh, you know, we've got the desks and the chairs. Um, just the, got one minute? Yeah. Uh, I'll send your arm at the gentleman's name, but I went to a conference recently where this gentleman got up and spoke about um, you know, looking into the future. It was an education conference looking into the future, and he used a program called the Jetsons. Now, some of you here would never have heard of that, but the Jetsons was this futuristic, you know, um, um, uh, cartoon type, type show, yeah. And, and um, they said, let's look at what was, what was projected here for the future. And this, this was probably in the 60s. It was, it, was out, it was a long time ago anyway. I was in nappies, of course, in the 60s. But, but, um, and they had the robot uh, vacuum cleaner. You know, that exists. You've seen that little round thing that bounces off the walls and does it all automatic. Had robotics everywhere. Well, we see that everywhere, um, et cetera, et cetera. Went on, then he went to a shot of the classroom the classroom of the future, what it looked like. Rows of kids with a teacher up the front with a board. And you go into um, a lot of schools and that's still how, how it is, how it is. Um, is, is. Is that good or bad? I mean, it's horses to courses as well. I mean, I grabbed my old kindergarten photo the other day and, and um, I was telling Recep, Recep said I didn't, they didn't have cameras in those days, but they did. <laughs> Well, 52, one, 52 kids in that class. Yeah, that's how it was. No. And, and um, Sister Ursula was my uh, teacher. I'll never forget, I've still got the scars to show. To, to, to show. That's, that's it. She's here today. But yeah, it's courses for courses is what, what I'm saying. But I, I think, uh, I, I think as an architect, yes, you, you, you and your colleagues have got um, um, you know, a massive uh, task in front of you designing these schools for the future.